Welcome back to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're continuing our coverage of the 2017 adaptation of Stephen King's It, directed by Andy Muschietti. I covered the first half of the movie in part one to this Kill Count, which you can watch here if you haven't seen it yet. Otherwise, let's get back to those kills. When we last left off, the kids were about to head inside Niebold House after learning it was the center to so many of Derry's historical tragedies. After an off-screen straw drawing, Bill, Richie, and Eddie are the ones who wind up going inside. Richie finds and freaks out over a missing kids poster with his face and name on it, but Bill tells him to ignore it because it's not real. They hear a little girl's voice and go upstairs to follow it, and at the end of the hallway up there, they see Betty rip some, and oh, nope, there she goes. As Bill and Richie go to help her, Eddie is distracted by a noise he hears, so they wind up getting separated after a door closes between them. A hole opens up in the floor in front of Eddie, and his old friend Def Leper appears, scaring him backwards to the ground floor below. Richie then hears Eddie's voice coming from another room, so he heads inside to check it out. But once again, a door closes and separates the kids from one another. The lights in the room flicker and reveal its contents. A whole bunch of clowns. Richie's all like, get out of here, you bunch of clowns. Oh, and look, OG Pennywise is chilling in the back there. That's a fun little Easter egg that's not charred and smoking. At the end of the room is a coffin, and inside is a pretty well-made Richie puppet thing. Then Pennywise pops out and plays us a golden oldie that we haven't heard in a while. Beep, beep, Richie. He charges at Richie in a CG, but thankfully not jerky manner, but Bill's able to get the door open and rescue him. Then a visage of Eddie pops up through a mattress to Bill and Richie and vomits up some acid spit which flows towards them and chases them into a room with a fucked up version of Let's Make a Deal. They opt for the safest choice, but it's still got half of Betty Ripsom hanging out in there. That's some false advertising door. And by the way, I wasn't sure whether or not to include Betty on the count, but decided against it since these are just visions of her, even though she's definitely dead. I don't know, man. Things are even worse for Eddie downstairs, whose arm is broken as fuck. Some Pennywise leftovers come out of the fridge, and, uh, hey, anyone know how long that clown's been in there? Is it still good, or can we toss it? Pennywise makes a big show as he approaches Eddie, and not only is that fun for Bill Skarsgård, but it also serves a point to the plot. You see, the bigger the fear, the more flavor inside. Tasty, tasty, beautiful fear. So Pennywise gets Eddie nice and marinated before digging in. But before Penny can say clown apatie, Bill convinces Richie that none of this is real, and they're able to overcome their fears and get to where Eddie is. Seems like the not real argument might not work here though. This isn't real enough for you, Billy. I'm not real enough for you. <laughs> it wasn't real enough for Georgie. Oh, low blow, clown. That kind of dick move deserves a freaking rod in the head, courtesy of Ms. Beverly Marsh. The other kids come to the rescue as Pennywise bleeds out from his wound. He lashes out at them like a wounded animal, but they stand together to oppose him, even as Ben gets sliced open by some clown claws. Knowing when to cut his losses, Pennywise bows out in retreat, but Bill follows him all the way down to the basement and watches as he escapes down the well. After Richie performs some ill-advised bone resetting, the kids GTFO of Nebold House. Eddie's mom picks him up up and yells at the others for getting him hurt. She drives off, leaving only six losers behind, and when Bill wants to start preparing for next time, Stan counts himself out as well, saying he's had enough of this shit. A split happens, with Beverly, the only one taking Bill's side, and Richie bringing things to a boil by saying that Bill needs to face facts because Georgie's freaking dead. That turns into a face punch and the dissolution of the friend group, even though Bev argues that it's vital they remain a team. We were all together when we heard it. That's why we're still alive. Richie doesn't buy it and leaves in a huff. And even Ben would prefer to skip all the heroism and live to get out of Derry. Finally, Mike says he's just an outsider and should stay that way, and the losers officially disband. A montage shows the passage of time, as all good montages do, with the kids growing up in their own individual ways. Then it's August, and we're back again with the Bowers gang. When Henry wants to shoot a cat that looks way too much like Lucy for me, his dad finds him and thankfully stops it, then shoots the ground in front of him to show the audience exactly how to raise a little psychopath of their own. Later, when Henry is stewing, a balloon appears on his mailbox, and inside is the knife he lost back when he was practicing his penmanship on Ben's stomach. He takes the knife inside, where Butch Bowers is passed out in his dad chair. The TV provides Henry some instructions on what to do next. Make it a wonderful day. Kill him. And since TV was probably a better father than Butch ever was, Henry listens to it. Butch wakes up to a blade in the neck and struggles in confusion as his psychopathic son holds him down, killing him for a very memorable, very dark moment in this movie and the third kill on our count. Then Pennywise cameos on the telly to encourage Henry to keep it up. Eddie also has a scene of self-growth, although his is decidedly less murdery. When he goes to pick up his medicine from the pharmacist, the pervy dude's daughter, the same bully who orchestrated the trash waterfall on Bev's head in the beginning, picks on him for not having any signatures on his cast. Then she tells him his medicine is just a vial full of lies. They're placebos. What does placebo mean? Placebo means bullshit. She offers to sign his cast, but it doesn't look like she's writing anything nice on it. When Bev tries to leave her house, she finds the front door locked and her dad in maximum creeper mode. You're looking pretty up. He calls her over and insinuates things about her because of her all-male friend squad and the postcard poem he found in her underwear drawer. Then things get pretty bad. Are you still my girl? No! <laughs> 
Al winds up on top of his daughter in a terrifying act of sexual abuse. Luckily, Bev fights back, kicking him in the crotch and running away from him to hide in the bathroom. He follows and kicks the door open, but Bev responds with a toilet tank lid to the head that knocks him the fuck out. Great job, Bev. Things would be going great for you if it weren't for that Pennywise grabbing you by the neck. When Bev's late to meeting Bill, he heads to her house and finds her dad knocked out on the bathroom floor. But he's very pointedly still breathing and making alive noises, so again, no go on the count. Bill also finds a message written in blood. You die if you try. Bill's on a mission now, and it's not to see Nightmare 5. Good thing, because Dream Child blows. Instead, it's to recruit the losers to help him save Bev, starting with Richie, who's still pissed off at him over that face punch. See that guy I'm hitting? Pretending it's you. When he tells Richie that it got Bev, Richie puts his street fighting on hold. They call up Eddie, who's altered his cast graffiti to be a little more complimentary, but on his way out, his mom tries to stop him based on his delicate constitution. He finally fights back against his overbearing mother. See what these are? They're gazebos! They're bullshit! And flees from her and his house to go help his friends. The other losers are recruited off screen, and together, the six boys bike their way to Neibolt Street. Mike armed with his granddad's bolt gun, cause sometimes he likes to roleplay as Anton Chigurh. As they arm themselves with fence rods, they don't notice Belcher's car on the street, watching and waiting for them to go inside. Now, there's a deleted scene from the theatrical release that's pretty gosh darn relevant to our interest here on The Kill Count, since it shows that Henry killed Vic and Belch, and I struggled immensely over whether or not to include it. I settled on leaving it out because I don't want to set a precedent for including extraneous materials, like deleted scenes, if they're not included in a fully completed version of the film. And by the way, this scene and others will be integrated in a director's cut promised to us later this year, but the studio didn't include it on this initial Blu-ray release because it wants people to buy the movie twice, which is total fucking bullshit. They head into the house, although Stan needs a little extra coaxing, and go downstairs to find the broken well. They throw a rope down it and begin to descend, finding a tunnel a little ways down. But after everyone except for Mike is safely down, Henry shows up and attacks him. Henry shows his crazy bloody face to the others down below. <laughs> Mike! Where's he? <laughs> then turns around to finish the job. He pins Mike down and puts the bolt gun to his head. But Mike ain't no sheep, Bauer, so at the last minute, he fights back and avoids the bolt. Close one. Granddad would be proud. Mike hits Henry with a rock to get him off, then freaking Goldberg spears him into the well. Henry falls down past the others, and here's another complication, because the movie leaves newcomers thinking Henry is dead. But I think he'll be back, because it would be a drastic change from the source material to not have him in part two. So another missed count opportunity. Sorry. Bev wakes up in a big old trash room full of a bunch of dead kids floating in the air. It finally gives meaning to the whole you'll float too thing, although I'll note that this is a movie invention and doesn't come from the book. Then Bev gets treated to a show. It's everyone's favorite meme, Pennywise the Dancing Clown. Pennywise is a clown? Pennywise is a clown. Look at him dance like a look at him go, like a look at him dance like a clown. He jumps out to greet his audience, but finds the reception lacking. I'm not afraid of you. Oof, that fruit ain't ripe yet, Penny. Better put it in storage with your deadlights until it's nice and tasty with fear. Deadlights, they're like the crisper drawer in your fridge. Stan somehow gets separated from the others when he thinks he hears Bev, and as he stumbles around by himself, he's greeted with spooky CGI face running at the camera. When the others come and find him, they see the painting lady chowing down on little Ursus Minor, but at the sight of them together, painting lady backs away from them and disappears down a pipe, popping back out just to be like, hey, you guys know this is actually Pennywise, right? Yeah, they know, clown. The other kids get Stan up and running, although he's understandably in hysterics and not too pleased with having been left alone. While they tend to him, Bill sees Georgie running around the sewer and follows him through the tunnels to the big old trash heap room, where he finds Beverly floating in the air, her eyes glazed over. Instead of helping her down right away, though, he continues his Georgie hunt, so it's up to the other kids to help her down when they come into the big sewer chamber. After checking out all those helium-filled dead kids, of course. And no, the floating dead kid crew isn't going on the count either, because there's just too many of them to count and they keep floating around. It's hard to get enough. Number on him. I know this kill count isn't that exciting if you're just here to see numbers get tallied, but hopefully you're watching for more than just that. They drag Bev down to ground level, and Ben does the only thing he can think of, delivering true love's kiss, question mark? It totally works, meaning Ben should be called Life Lips for the rest of his days, and Bev finally recognizes that game. General Yambers. My heart burns there too. Before Ben can capitalize and get a non-catatonic smooch though, Richie hugs them both, and Mike jumps in too, cause hey, might as well be a group thing in the sewer now. Wink. Bill finds a one-armed Georgie, who he has a tearful conversation with about paper boats and shit. Georgie asks Bill to take him home, and Bill says, yeah, that'd be great, except there's just one little problem. But you're not Georgie. <laughs> Dude, for a second there, I thought maybe it was Georgie, somehow having survived in the sewer this whole time, and that it'd be a real fucked up twist with Bill actually killing him. But no, that little kid is a clown in disguise, obviously. Pennywise sits up, and I hope you all ready to rumble, because the main event is about to get started. Bill puts the bolt gun at Pennywise's head, and even though Mike yells to him that it's not loaded, Bill pulls the trigger, and it apparently hurts Pennywise, because the power of imagination, yo. The fight breaks out entirely now, as Pennywise fights all the kids at once, throwing them around the sewer, and definitely having the upper hand. He eventually gets Bill in a hold, and makes an offer to the others. Leave 
him alone to nom down on Bill, and they can all live long, happy lives, never having to look over their shoulder to see if a clown is running at them in jerky CG. Bill co-signs the agreement out of guilt for leading everyone down there, and it looks like Richie might too, since he gives a speech about how this is all Bill's fault and lists all the shit he's had to do because of it. And now... I'm gonna have to kill this fucking clown. Yeah, that's right, these losers stand together. The fight continues with a lot more showmanship this time around. As all the kids attack Pennywise, he transforms into the various things that terrify them, along with a cameo appearance by some spider crab claws in a reference to the miniseries, and a mummy with bandages attacking Ben in a reference to the book. He saves the real terror for last, Bev's rapey fucking father, but that only encourages her to put a rod through his mouth. Eat it, clown! That's pretty much it for Mr. P.Y.'s, who crawls away from them in defeat until his back's against another drain pipe. Bill recognizes that the clown is scared because now he's gonna starve, and Pennywise backflips into the pipe. Before he drops out of sight entirely, his head begins to disintegrate, and he offers one final parting word. Fear. Down he goes. See you in 2019, Bill. The day is saved and the kid corpses all float down. Bill finds Georgie's raincoat and the others all group hug him, because that's what you do when you're the best of friends. Later in the year, Bev tells them about a dream she had where she saw them all, much older, back in the sewer. That prompts Bill to start a blood pack. If it isn't dead, if it ever comes back, We'll come back to. They all agree to it and get their hands sliced open to make it count. It's a real nice moment and another scene that shows how this isn't just a good horror movie, it's a really well-made movie overall. Eventually, the losers filter out one by one, each returning home on their own, until it's just Bill and Bev talking about how Bev's about to leave town to go live with her aunt. When she goes to leave, Bill realizes this is his last chance to act on his feelings, and he gives her a goodbye kiss. Good read, Bill. She like it. She like it a lot. And that's it. Chapter one, motherfuckers. Hell of a movie. Did it have a hell of a body count? Spoiler alert, no it did not. Here, I'll show you at the numbers. By my count, only three people died in it 2017, a new kill count low. All three victims were male, so maybe I should have found a way to work Betty Ripsum in to add a little variety here. At a runtime of 135 minutes, that comes out to a kill on average, get this, every 45 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Georgie. It's the horror movie kill we've always heard about, but never seen. Until now. And this movie's depiction did the legend justice. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Patrick Hockstetter. Love the scene leading up to it, but ultimately, it's just more Pennywise running at the camera. And that's it. It was released in 2017 and quickly garnered the highest opening weekend box office for a horror movie ever. It was hugely popular, then faced some backlash, as can be expected, but I still think it's an amazing film that's funny as hell. On Monday, I've got the best kills in Friday the 13th for you, and next Friday, we're gonna start on A Nightmare on Elm Street. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thank you for watching part two of my Kill Count for IT 2017. I want to thank some of my patrons like Chris McCrate and Lilith Mulliken. If you want to join that Patreon family, you can click the button on the screen right over there. Patreon emailed me to say that in 2017, I was more active than 95% of creators. What? Next week is gonna be a big week on this channel, between the Friday the 13th franchise kills and A Nightmare on Elm Street beginning.